in San Francisco, and we're very happy to welcome um, a thousand souls and counting for Surveillance Rover's latest science and future plans. Um, with us here today, oh, not broadcasting now, apparently. <laughs> it's all right. We'll try again. Thanks, Bill. <coughs> Are we good now? Can everyone hear me? All right. One more time. Welcome to our 1.30 p.m. press conference on a thousand souls and counting Perseverance Rover's latest science and future plans. With us here today, we have Minashki Mini Wadwa from the Arizona State University, Morgan Cable and Libby Ives from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Ken Farley from Caltech, and Lori Glaze from NASA. Um, we're going to run through all of our presentations, and then we will open the floor to Q&A here in the room in San Francisco and online. And we'll give you some further instructions at that point. But if you are online, you can drop that question in the Q&A box at any time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Minashi Mini. Oh, to me. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> I got you in the <laughs> wrong order. The table. Um, yeah. You're welcome to come up to the podium or sit there if you prefer. I'm going to stay here. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you for everybody that's, that's here today. Uh, we're here to uh, recognize an incredible milestone for the Perseverance rover. Uh, we're here to recognize 1,000 sols on the surface of Mars, which is a pretty incredible achievement and an amazing amount of science that's been done um, so far um, in the first 1,000 sols. Um, so the first thing I want to do is show you here, this is uh, kind of where we've been uh, since sol zero uh, right up until today, uh, December 12th, 2023. Um, and uh, over this time period, uh, we've conducted four uh, science campaigns, and you're going to hear from our group here today about some of the results from each of those science campaigns, um, beginning with the Crater Floor campaign, then the Delta Front campaign, the Upper Fan campaign, and the Margin campaign that we're in, entering in right now. Um, over this time, the, the rover has traveled almost 14 and a half miles, and we now have uh, a collection of 26 samples. Um, and I have one of the sample tubes up here. This is an actual sample tube. Um, this is not one, of course, that flew on the rover, uh, but this is, um, this is an actual real um, sample tube. It has a serial number on it, number 53, if you can see on there. Um, and up here is where you, every time we see pictures of samples, you'll see some in the slides today. You're looking down this end of the tube um, to see those samples when they've been collected. Um, of those 26 samples, of course, 10 um, have been laid on the ground at three forks um, as a cache, uh, as a kind of backup cache for the future. Um, and that leaves uh, 13 rock samples on board. Uh, this includes uh, the, uh, the uh, companion samples of those that were left at three forks, the 13 rock cores, one regolith sample, and two witness tubes on board um, the rover right now. Um, Mars uh, 2020 and Perseverance is, in fact, the first step of Mars sample return. Um, that's why we're collecting these samples. It has been a dream for decades and generations um, to bring a sample of Mars back to Earth for study. Um, this has been an incredibly high priority in planetary science for um, at least the last two decades as part of our National Academy's decadal surveys. And the reason this is so important and ranks so highly in those decadal surveys is that this uh, bringing the samples back here to Earth is what will provide the ground truth for the decades of remote sensing and in-situ data that we have uh, from exploring Mars. So incredibly important to bring these samples back to help us really ground uh, the, our understanding of the geologic history, the climate history, and the astrobiology potential um, for Mars. We took an, a strategy over the last several decades to starting with following the water and then understanding the habitability of Mars, all of this leading to helping us pick this ideal location uh, in Jezero Crater uh, where we can address these key questions about geology, climate, and astrobiology. And you're going to hear a lot more about that from the, from the team here. Uh, of course, we have a lot of challenges still ahead with Mars sample return. Um, but we are, we believe we have the technology uh, that's ready for us to do Mars sample return and we have good partnerships with our international ESA, ESA colleagues. Um, just a, a, a one last thing to say, the importance of uh, sample return beyond just understanding and our team here today, once we get the samples back to uh, study with all of our uh, scientists around the world today, but the importance of sample return is that we can then preserve those samples for decades and generations to come so that scientists who haven't even been born yet um, can 
address questions that we haven't thought of yet using instrumentation that hasn't been invented. So there's just uh, an incredible amount of value here that starts with perseverance. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ken Farley. Thanks, Lori. I'm Ken Farley. I'm a project scientist for the Perseverance mission. Uh, and as you just heard, uh, Perseverance has now completed its first thousand sols on Mars. This has been a very exciting and very busy time for the science and engineering time. And I hope we will uh, bring some of the excitement to you here, share some of the discoveries that we've made recently. Uh, but one, one thing I want to point out is that in addition to this symbolic milestone of a thousand sols, there actually is an important milestone that Perseverance has achieved. And that is that Perseverance has now completed its journey across the major target that brought this mission to this crater. So what I'm going to do in my few minutes here is provide some background and some context for the discoveries that the rest of the group here is going to talk about. Uh, prior to the launch of the, the Mars 2020 mission, the science community met to consider where is the best place to go to study habitability and to look for ancient life on Mars and also to collect the samples that justify the major effort of Mars sample return. And after multiple workshops, the community came to the conclusion that Jezero Crater was the place to go of anywhere on the surface of Mars. It was the place to go. And what I'm showing you in this image here from the high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is why. So what you're looking at here is uh, an image of the delta. So just to remind you of what this is, in the background in the hills that you see there, that's the rim of Jezero Crater. It's about four or 500 meters high. And you can see the sinuous canyon that cuts through the rim. And about three and a half or maybe 3.7 billion years ago, a river carrying sediment was flowing through that canyon. So the climate was extremely different at that time than it is today. When the river hit the slack water of a lake, the sediment that was carried by that river was deposited in the feature that you see in the middle distance there. That's the delta. This is a very important uh, aspect of this site it is, it is the thing that demonstrates that this is a habitable environment or a potentially habitable environment, at least a lake environment. It's a very uh, promising place to look for ancient life. But more than that, the deposition of a delta provides preservation of things that might have been alive at that time in the sediments that get deposited. So this was the major uh, uh, single target uh, that led to the mission coming to this site, and we have now completed this journey across this feature. Uh, at this point, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we can go ahead uh, to the next one. Um, I'm going to just show you here a, uh, an image and then a uh, pan through this image that we recently acquired uh, from the rover. This is a truly amazing mosaic of about a thousand images stitched together that we got down from the rover over the last couple of weeks that shows the area that we have explored and where we will explore in the future. So this is going to be uh, posted on the Photo Journal website soon. I strongly encourage you to go look at this. It is enormously rich. It's very exciting to imagine just walking off in any direction here. Um, I really love this, this mosaic. So while we have been exploring uh, this delta, um, we have learned an enormous amount about the period, about 3.5 to 3.7 billion years ago, when there were lakes and rivers flowing into Jezero Crater. And Libby's going to give you some of the details of what we have learned about that time period. And then Morgan is going to talk about the uh, habitable paleo environments that we discovered in these rocks and the minerals that were produced within them that have the, the ability to potentially preserve uh, anything that might have lived at that time, as well as to record information about the characteristics of those environments, such as temperature. And then Minnie will conclude with uh, a discussion of the samples that we've collected, because one of the central objectives, as Lori mentioned, uh, of this mission is to prepare a set of samples to be brought back to Earth. And when Minnie is done, I'll come back and I will say a little bit about where we are going in the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Libby. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, so I'm a sedimentary geologist uh, working as part of the Mars 2020 science team to understand 
this amazing fan that Ken just described to you, this beautiful three and a half billion year old pile of sediment. And after a thousand souls on Mars and those um, working through the observations we made as part of the Delta Front campaign and the, um, oh no, the fan. The upper fan, upper fan. The, the upper yeah. fan campaign, excuse me. Um, we've come to develop an understanding of the sedimentary history recorded in those layers of sediment, the geologic context of the fan within the crater, how it relates to the other geologic units of Jezero Crater, as well as we're able to give geologic context to all these awesome samples that we've collected so far with the Perseverance rover and gain some insight into the potential past habitability of these sedimentary environments, these watery sedimentary environments that once existed within Jezero Crater. So for the rest of the, my little bit here, we're gonna travel back in time three and a half to 3.7 billion years ago, and I'm gonna walk you chronologically through the history um, of water in Jezero Crater as it's recorded in this fan. Um, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's me. Um, as Ken so nicely laid out, before you get a fan, you have to have a river. The, um, and we have all of this geomorphic evidence from orbital observations that a large river at some point breached the crater rim and flowed and spread out within Jezero Crater. And that is where, on, uh, and that is where our fan was deposited downstream of where the water entered the crater and flowed out over the crater floor that was covered in lava flows. Um, after that, within the fan itself, we've observed essentially three chapters of the watery history of this river's contribution to Jezero Crater that are recorded in the fan. And I'm gonna walk you through those three, um, those three chapters now. The first chapter, our oldest rocks that are at the base of the fan, um, are, um, they are these wonderful flat line, laterally extensive, fine grain rocks that are exemplified in this image, especially um, in the lower right hand corner of the image. We have these bright toned rocks at this outcrop that we call Hogwallow Flats. They're so bright that um, in our orbital imagery, which you can see in the inset there, they really pop out. Um, and you might have, if you've been following the mission, you might have heard this outcrop affectionately referred to as the bacon strip in the past. Our current leading hypothesis for the deposition of this first chapter is that that river, initially it flowed out onto the crater floor and this crater floor was intermitt intermittently covered with what were probably relatively shallow lakes. And you can imagine that akin um, to on Earth, like a, a playa lake environment in a desert that's seasonally wet or covered in water. But the really the significant of significance of this lowermost unit comes from its fine grain nature. And what I mean by that is these sedimentary rocks, those light toned rocks you see in the picture are made up of very tiny sedimentary grains. So things like mud and silt and fine sand. And the significance of that is that water can um, very easily be trapped between those very tiny grains. And because of their size and the tiny pore spaces between them, they're also really good at entrapping, entombing, and sometimes adhering to them um, potential evidence of past life. So the samples we've collected from this first chapter um, are, I know that a lot of people are really looking forward to bringing those back to Earth. Um, but at, after we explored this area as part of our Delta Front campaign, we drove the rover up and across the top of the fan. And as we did that, we started to see evidence in the sedimentary record that the water level was rising. And it was rising enough that it began to change the type of sedimentary rocks that were deposited. Um, and with that, that brings us to chapter two. Um, and this is, sorry, I, this is just my favorite image. It's just so beautiful. Um, so the, chapter two, the second chapter, the middle of the fan sandwich is, is best exemplified by this image, which is a mosaic of images collected with our MassCam Z instrument of the side of a hill called Pine Stand Mountain. And what I want you to see in this image is there's a bunch of these dipping bands that make up the side of this hill that are alternating light tone, dark tone, and sort of swooping down across the side. And each of those is around 10 to 11 meters tall, um, 30 to 33 feet tall. So this is a pretty big hill, um, one that you could probably... Can you try again? 
Excuse me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got it. <laughs> pretty big hill. Um, and each of those layers is made up of an, two alternating types of sedimentary rock, a sandstone and the light-toned bands, and then a conglomerate, so something with like pebbles and cobbles in it in the sort of dark-toned bands. And what the geometry and composition of those layers is, is telling us is that these layers were deposited successively, one right after another, sort of piling on top of each other across this image from left to right, and they were deposited in water that was at least as deep as these bands are tall. So there was water in the crater, um, we, and at, in this image that was around um, probably 30 feet deep, but in other, we have some of these bands that are up to 25 meters tall. So, um, and that's why this image really is striking to me because it, it illustrates that we, you know, there was that depth of water we have that captured in our sedimentary record um, in Jezero Crater. Let's see. So that's chapter two, and now I'm gonna bring us to chapter three. So this is our final chapter um, rec uh, recorded in the Jezero Crater fan. This is our youngest sedimentary deposit. It's the highest in the fan. And what this, this chapter is made out of is these mounds of cobbles and boulders that are distributed across the fan surface. And this, I know it's hard to tell scale in these images, but a lot of these boulders are up to, are around one meter across or three feet across. These are big rocks, probably not something you're picking up by yourself. Um, and I want you to also see that many of them are rounded in shape. And what the shape and the size of these rocks tell us is that they were transported into the crater by a very powerful river. And that, and because of their position at the top of the fan, that um, really powerful flow that brought them in was the last event, the final chapter in the deposition of Jezero Crater three and a half billion years ago. So that concludes my little chapter book here, but we're not done yet. Um, Mars 2020, as was mentioned, is in the midst of studying what we are calling the marginal unit. And this is a unit that a lot of people in the Mars science community have been very excited to study for a long time. And part of that reason um, is illustrated on the map you're seeing on the screen. So this is a map of Jezero Crater and the different colors illustrate different um, mineralogical signals that we've been able to observe from orbit. And anywhere you see that bright Kelly green color is a very strong carbonate signal. And, um, and so you might have heard, if you, again, if you've been following the mission, you've maybe heard this referred to as the bathtub ring because it's a ring of carbonate um, that goes around the inside edge of the crater. And that's the unit we're currently studying. So far, we've been able to confirm that this rock is a clastic sedimentary rock. It's, it's akin to a sandstone, much like I just described, but we're still working really hard to understand um, its relationship with the other rocks in the fan. Um, but anyway, that's my timeline. That's sort of a broad overview of the amazing history that's recorded in the Jezero Crater Western Fan. It gives us, you know, a lot of context for the Mars sample return mission and the potential science that can be done with those samples and potential for habitability, but it's just one side of the story. Um, the rovers collected a ton of really wonderful geochemical data, and for that I'm very happy to turn it over to Morgan. Thank you, Libby. Hi. My name is uh, Morgan Cable, and I am a member of the leadership team for the Pixel instrument. This is one of the proximity science instruments, so this is on the arm of the rover. And when we say proximity science, that's because we really get up close and personal to these rocks. When Pixel, which is an X-ray instrument, makes its measurements, we get about an inch away from these rocks or, or these other parts of the Martian surface that we want to study. And then we essentially fire a beam of x-rays that's no bigger than a few human hairs in diameter. And based on how those x-rays interact with that rock, uh, we can get an idea of its mineralogy, its chemical composition. And this chemistry tied in with the geology that Libby talked about is what helps us form a picture of this history of Jezero Crater. And so Pixel does this you know, many, many times and generates these maps that are on the order of the size of about a postage stamp. And I'm gonna show you a couple of results from two places uh, that we've collected measurements in the last couple of months. Uh, one of them is called Uzel Falls. That's a measurement we made and we love that place enough. We were convinced that it was compelling enough that we collected a, a core called Otis Peak that is currently sitting on the Perseverance rover. 
Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about Bill's Bay, which was another set of measurements that was compelling enough that we decided to collect a sample there as well that's called Lafroy Bay. And now both of these places on Mars are in that upper fan and margin unit uh, that Libby talked about, so sort of chapters two and maybe chapter three, right? Okay, so let's dive in. All right, so this is a, an image from our navigation camera, and I think this is, this is a Bill's Bay, and uh, this gives a good example of sort of what an area will look like after we have uh, done some measurements and then decided to collect a core. So you see two spots where we have interacted here uh, with this area. One of them looks sort of like a depression, sort of in the lower left, and these are spaced about a foot apart from each other for scale. And that's where we have abraded the surface with our rock abrasion tool. Uh, that's so that we can get underneath any dust or crust and be able to use Pixel and some of our other proximity science instruments to get a good look at what's inside, what the real chemistry and the composition is of that rock. And then if we like what we see, in this case we definitely did, and I'll show you why in a minute, uh, we decided to collect a core. In this case, this was called Lafroy Bay, and that's the sort of more volcano-looking uh, feature there in the upper right. But what was compelling enough to make us want to collect a sample here? Well, this is what it looks like by eye. Can you tell why it's so exciting? You can't? You can't see? That's okay. What we're going to do now is put on our X-ray specs. And so this is what Pixel saw when it was able to collect this postage stamp size a set of measurements of this rock. And we've highlighted in two different colors two of the key mineral types. Uh, in this rock that are so exciting for us. In purple, what you can see are these are carbonate-rich minerals that are present in these about millimeter-sized grains in this rock. And in between that, that green color is silica. So this is a very, very fine-grained silica sands, uh, very small crystals on the order of maybe like half the size of a human hair, like 40 microns, super tiny. And what these grains did is they moved in, they cemented, and were able to to you know, be able to trap, potentially, if there are any organics or biosignature molecules, they would be very well preserved in this kind of environment. So the fact that we see these two minerals together tells us that uh, the conditions were ripe to preserve organic molecules, to prevent them from degrading, and because that silica is able to come in and cement and sort of keep this together and uh, be able to entomb potential organic molecules if they're there, you can sort of think of it as like, like a, a mummy's tomb, being able to preserve that from degradation for uh, three and a half billion years. We felt that this was really exciting and compelling and that this was a great candidate sample to be able to return uh, back to Earth. And so we collected Lefroy Bay, or excuse me, Yes, Lafroy Bay, right, uh, was the, the name of the core that was collected here. So that was one exciting uh, set of measurements we made. The other one is at Uzel Falls. Uh, and so this looks a little bit different, this nav cam, navigation camera image from the previous one I showed you. We have not one but two little, little volcano-like uh, features here that we have made on the Martian surface. And that's because uh, when we made our measurements with the pixel instrument, with our other proximity science instruments, we found this was an incredibly compelling place, but our first uh, attempt to core, uh, we weren't very happy with it. It didn't quite fill the tube, and so we made a second attempt that was very successful, actually right on top of where we did our abrasion, which is why you see two volcanoes and, and no depression. Uh, but let's take a look at what was so compelling and why we felt that this was such an exciting uh, sample to collect. We were very fortunate at Uzo Falls. We were able to collect three separate pixel scans, which you can see in the color boxes here and this is just a, a color image but before we put on our x-ray specs you can even see by eye that there are some interesting colors here in fact in that red box you may see some things that look a little bit bluish or a little bit green now that is not a trick of the eye in fact if we put on our x-ray specs now uh, you can see that that is consistent with the colors that we've put here that are consistent with phosphate so these are um, minerals that are rich in phosphate. Now we see some phosphate rich minerals like apatite all over Mars, but this is a different kind. This is an iron phosphate. And this is some of the strongest evidence we have for this type of phosphate mineral. Now that's important because that tells us when this rock formed, that phosphorus was 
more readily available to potential life in that lake environment uh, that Libby described. Uh, so this was very exciting for us because now we see the ingredients that life as we know it needs all in the same place at the same time present with these other minerals like silica and carbonate that indicate this would be a great rock to preserve any evidence of potential biosignatures over long periods of time. Uh, so that was what was so incredibly exciting about this. It was so nice, we sampled it twice, and so now we have very happily that uh, core, the Otis Peak core on uh, the Perseverance rover, and I can't wait for these samples to come back to Earth. Uh, some very lucky scientists will hopefully get an opportunity to study that core in detail, and for more information on that, I'm happy to pass it over to Minnie Wadwa. All right, thank you, Morgan, and good afternoon. My name is Minnie Wadwa, and I am the principal scientist for the Mars Sample Return Program. So as Lori mentioned before, uh, Mars sample return has been the top priority for a large-scale mission in the last two planetary science, National Academy's planetary science decadals. And obviously, you know, MSR as we know it, I mean, this, is, this would be one of the most audacious robotic missions ever conducted. Um, and as an independent review board recently emphasized, it remains incredibly important for its high strategic and scientific value. Uh, scientifically, of course, uh, there are questions about early planetary evolution, uh, about when, where, and how life may have originated um, in a rocky habitable world that can only really be addressed by bringing back and studying carefully selected samples from a planet like Mars that had abundant water on its surface early in its history and which basically preserved that ancient record very, very well. Um, on Earth, of course, because of processes like plate tectonics and weathering, we don't have that record anymore. It's a very sparse rock record of things older than about three and a half billion. But Mars, of course, there's a significant fraction of the Martian surface that actually preserves that record very well, including the area, of course, that uh, um, Jezero the crater area that Perseverance is exploring. And of course, Ken mentioned the fact that it was chosen for that reason. So here, this graphic actually shows the 13 different rocks that are currently on board Perseverance. And so in the thousand souls that Perseverance has been exploring the Jezero crater, crater region, and in, in the different campaigns, the four different campaigns that have been investigating uh, the surface of this area so far, we have this incredible array of samples, which, you know, when I, as a sample scientist, when I look at it, this really gets my heart going. This is so exciting to have this incredible array of samples. And so what you see here, are actually, each rock is represented by a pair of images. And on the left side of each of this pair is the core, the top of the core, as seen uh, from a camera that's looking, at, looking down at that. And then the next set, the second one, the second image on the right is, a uh, picture of the abrasion patch. That's the abraded part of the rock that was studied with proximity science, uh, the kinds of things that Morgan talked about. And that's about five centimeters across. The top of the sample core, as Lori just showed, that's about a centimeter across. And so that's just to sort of orient you a little bit. But as you can see, there's this incredible, just by looking at these images, you can see there's an incredible diversity of rock types that is on board Perseverance at the current time. and. Basically, besides these, there is, of course, a regular sample and also two witness tubes, and so a total of something like 16 tubes that have been sealed that are on board Perseverance at the current time. And these, of course, Perseverance in the current um, um, plan is the primary pathway for delivering samples to the sample retrieval lander in a future Mars sample return. And so we've got this incredible array of samples, of course, that are on board Perseverance. You can see, of course, that uh, uh, the ones that are on the upper left here, those are four uh, rocks that were collected from the crater floor. Uh, these are all igneous rocks, meaning that they formed from solidification of magma. And that was in itself kind of a surprise because we had expected to find sedimentary rocks at the bottom of this crater, but when we landed there and actually investigated these rocks, turned out to be igneous. But that's fantastic news, actually, because this, from these rocks, we can learn something about uh, early planetary evolution of Mars. And then the other rocks that are shown here for, for the delta front and the upper fan and margin, these are 
all different varieties of various types of sedimentary rocks that were formed in a variety, a range of conditions, some in quiescent lakes, some in raging rivers. And so they all record some kind of um, habitable environment. They're deposited by water. And so we have this incredible diversity that, of course, is, is, uh, is present on, on the rover at the current time. And what I'm going to show you in the next couple of graphics are two examples uh, that particularly il illustrate the kinds of science that we hope to be able to get from studying these rocks in detail once we bring, once we ho hopefully we'll bring them back to Earth for, um, and study them here. So the next graphic here is showing this rock called Rochette, which is the first rock that was sampled from the crater floor by Perseverance. And what you can see here is that this is actually an igneous rock. And so it's formed by solidification of magma. And as we've looked at it, actually, the kind of instrument that Megan, uh, Morgan talked about, the pixel instrument, basically showed us that it is made up of interlocking crystals of pyroxene and plagioclase. And we can actually, in laboratories here on Earth, we could actually date these minerals using radioisotope dating. And we can determine the timeline for igneous activity, for magma formation on early Mars, and gain insights about the early planetary evolution of, uh, of Mars. Uh, there's also minerals present in this rock that record ancient magnetic fields. And so we would basically be able to do paleomagnetic studies from which we could understand ancient magnetism on Mars as well. And that has implications for habitability of Mars as well in, uh, in ancient times. Um, you can see also in, in the image on the lower right that there are these white patches, and these are salts that were deposited, we think, by liquid water flowing through this rock at a later time after, after it had solidified from the magma. And these salts, again, these could preserve some biosignatures and so would have to be studied with techniques such as the highest resolution microscopy that we can, we can do on these samples to really um, show whether there are biosignatures that are preserved and potentially preserved in this type of rock. The next graphic here shows another example of another rock that was collected at the Delta front. Uh, this is uh, a rock called Hidden Harbor. And you can see from the abrasion patch on the top right that it's a very, it's one of the finest grained uh, sediments that has been collected so far. Uh, very fine grained texture that you can see and these beautiful um, sulfate veins. And if you look carefully at some of this texture, you can actually see that the sulfate uh, has multiple generations that are recorded uh, of that, that sulfate formation in veins as well as, as vug cements in this rock. And so this is the kind of rock that actually we would pull apart grain by grain and really study individual grains very, very carefully uh, to try to understand the provenance of these grains, to try to understand uh, the kind of chemistry of the water that deposited some of the minerals in this rock, as well as to try to understand potential biosignatures that might be preserved in this rock. We've actually looked at this rock with another instrument on the rover called Sherlock, and there's a very strong fluorescence signal in this rock, which could be indicative of the presence of organics, but that's something that would have to be confirmed once, these, once this sample is back on Earth and we can study it in laboratories in detail. And in fact, one, if there are organics present, the other thing to determine, of course, the important thing would be whether these are abiotic or biotic. Uh, organics. And so this is going to be something, of course, that we're going to be excited to study once, once these samples are here on Earth. So obviously, we've got this amazing diversity of materials now um, that we already have, but it's exciting to think about what's ahead as well. And in fact, when you look at uh, uh, rocks that might be in the crater rim and beyond that, these are recording an entirely different geologic environment. Uh, in terms of age, in terms of duration, in terms of possible distinct uh, uh, potential habitable environments. And uh, I'll turn it back to Ken to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so <clears throat> what you've just heard is that we have, as I said, we've traversed across this feature that brought us uh, to Jezero Crater. The science community basically said, go to this place and uh, hopefully you will collect samples and you will learn about the about this very important time when there were lakes and rivers on Mars and I would say mission accomplished we actually have done this we've acquired some very very good samples but there's more and in the Atlantic site selection workshops 
there was another faction of scientists who wished to explore the very ancient part of Mars that lies, coincidentally, right next to Jezero Crater. And so we put together a plan, and we are now implementing this plan, to continue onward across the margin unit that Libby told you about. And in the image you're looking at here, the margin unit is in the middle distance. It's the rocky unit in the middle distance. And then in the background, you see the crater rim. And the yellow line is our egress route. It is quite remarkable, actually, that there is a route that we can drive up with the rover. And that will allow us access to rocks that are much, much older, uh, probably five or 600 million years older. So we are going to be able to explore rocks deposited at that time to understand planetary evolution. And also, one of the reasons it was highlighted in the landing site selection workshop is there's a completely different kind of potentially habitable environment in the subsurface where groundwater interacts with rocks. And there's reason to believe that we will uh, explore rocks of that type as we climb up the rim and then as we move out into the area just beyond the rim. So that's the plan. We will likely start ascending the uh, rim uh, sometime in the spring uh, of next year. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to questions. Thank you so much, panelists. As we said, we're gonna jump over to questions from the room and online now. Um, if you're in the room, just wave at me and I'll bring you a mic. Please remember to identify yourself and who you work for to our panelists. And panelists will also ask you if you can remember to tell you, us your name again when you start speaking. I'll really help people in the back of the room. If you're online, Q&A box will get to you as well. I think I saw Alex first, then John, and then um, Joel. Hi, Alex Woodsy with Nature. I guess from Mini, um, can you talk a little bit about what happens to the types of tests you want to run on samples if the samples have to stick around on the surface for a long period of time? Like, at what point do they have too much exposure on the surface to be able to get extract useful information out of them? Well, I mean, these rocks have been sitting on the surface of Mars for eons, <laughs> for one thing. I don't, I honestly, you know, the ones that we are hoping to retrieve are the ones that are on board Perseverance. And so they are somewhat protected. Once they've been sampled, they are protected within the rover, and that's the prime cache that we are hoping to bring back. And so I, I think that there's, you know, they're going to be as, as well protected as, as is possible, um, given the current plan. Yeah, hi, I'm Jonathan Amos, BBC. <clears throat> so you're sending Perseverance off, um, but you don't yet have a, what you've told us, a fully fledged plan for Mars sample return. So where the rover goes, and because it's an integral part of that plan, you're starting to create, well, engineering constraints on yourself, right? Because you've got to go to where the rover is in order to get the samples that it has, because it will be handing them over to the landing system. So um, I, one sees the, the science reasoning for heading off, but as I say, that that then puts engineering constraints on you, and obviously cost constraints as well, depending on where you have to land, how you have to land, and how you get off the planet. So I'm just wondering how that all fits together. It's a good question, Jonathan, as Lori Glaze from NASA Headquarters, Planetary Science Division Director. Um, as, as you all are probably all aware, uh, we are in the middle of a uh, responding to the independent review board that came back and said we needed to rethink the overall architecture from our sample return and make sure that we're on a, a path that's executable um, to, to implement Mars sample return. Um, as you noted, of course, uh, Perseverance is uh, in the baseline as the primary delivery mechanism. Uh, as part of the response team right now, we're looking at different architectures and different ways to implement. Um, and thinking through uh, various options, such as uh, one that you mentioned is, you know, potentially landing wherever Perseverance is. Another option uh, that is being discussed and is uh, out there is that Perseverance continues collecting samples, but at some point uh, returns back to the crater floor within Jezero Crater, 
We actually know right there in front of the, the delta fan uh, on the crater floor is a, is a very, very flat, uh, well-constrained um, area that could be a good uh, landing site for the future sample retrieval lander. Uh, but right now we're still in the process of, of uh, you know, evaluating and looking at the various architecture options. Um, hello, Joel Alkenbach from the Washington Post, and thank you so much for uh, answering these questions. So my question is, was there life on Mars um, 3.5 billion or 3.7 billion years ago? And I know that's not an answerable question, but maybe you could give us a sense of, of whether or not the, the mission so far has moved the needle towards one hypothesis or, or another. And, um, and if there's anything in particular that has been seen or, or discovered or observed that uh, is particularly um, noteworthy. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Morgan Cable, uh, JPL, one of the, the leads of the Pixel Instrument. I think that we have very strong evidence now in multiple samples that we have collected in our journey up through the upper fan and through the margin unit that suggests all of the ingredients for life as we know it were in the same place at the same time. And so this is our opportunity to be able to test that theory of if, if biology is part of the natural evolution of a system, if you have all the right ingredients and you mix them together and you wait, does life form? That's the hypothesis that we get to test with the samples that come back. I think one of the most exciting things that I highlighted a bit with that last sample, Uzal Falls, is this presence of this new mineral phase of phosphate, an, an iron phosphate, and why that's so exciting is because this means that the one of these key elements, phosphorus, that's it's present in the DNA backbones of all known life, uh, it's present in the cell membranes of every single organism that we know of, it's part of the key energy currency, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We know that phosphorus is incredibly important and now we have the strongest evidence so far ever collected that, uh, that that mineral, that phosphorus was available in a form that life could access if it was there. So I think all of this compounded together means that this is such an incredible, the discoveries that Perseverance have made and the team has made and the potential that is housed within these samples that we're returning back is just so compelling. So we have seen phosphate minerals, things like apatite, uh, before all over Mars, and Ken can talk a little bit more about this, uh, but that tends to be locked away in a form that's less easily accessible by life. This iron phosphate mineral that we've found here at Uzo Falls, and I think we have evidence for it in a couple of other places as well, this is uh, more easily dissolved in liquid water, and so it's easier for life to grab it, to use it uh, for molecular machinery and the things it might need if it was there. If anyone wants to jump in, please. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just emphasize what Morgan said, because I think it's a very important point that the area that we've been investigating and the samples that we've co collected have the potential to falsify the hypothesis that, that Morgan made. We have gone to a place that by every characteristic that we have established so far appears to be habitable. If there is no life in it when these things get analyzed on Earth, we have learned something. And that actually makes it really different from, for example, a grab-and-go uh, kind of sample return mission that uh, w it was an alternative that was considered years ago. So there's a, a real potential to, as you say, move the needle. We can move the needle by actually having the right sample suite. All right, this is Rick Michlewski from the Register out of London. Uh, this is perhaps a very naive question to Ms. Ives. It, I was looking at that one photo you had of, I think it was called Pi Sands, that had the uh, bands that were 10 meters or so, but they were at 20 degree angles. What geological process caused those bands to move angular? That is such a wonderful question. Thank you. I'm very excited to answer it. Um, so Libby Ives, a postdoctoral fellow at, at JPL. Um, so not all sedimentary rocks are deposited flat. There are many instances where sedimentary rocks are deposited at an angle. And, yeah, and this is one of them. So 
Um, let's see, where was I going with that? Yeah, so we asked the same question when we first saw them. Those are really steep angles. Um, is there a possibility that these were moved tectonically from flat to angled? And the team consensus is no. We see no evidence for tectonic deformation or, or deformation that would have tilted those sediments when they were soft before they were turned to rock. Um, we see no evidence for that, and so th we believe that that is the angle at which these sediments were deposited. Yeah, and so that gives us a huge clue into the process that would have deposited those sediments, which is essentially avalanching of sand grains down a slope underwater. And that's what allows me to make the statement that um, the water must have been as as deep as those sets are tall, because essentially what happened is um, we know the sediments were transported by flowing water because the sediments are sorted, and water, depending on how fast it's flowing, now I'm getting too far into the weeds, sorry guys, uh, <laughs> um, can carry certain sizes of grain. So we, we know the water, or we know the sediment was transported by flowing water and then deposited into um, a deeper, yeah, on a slope like that. And you can see this. Um, in, it's a very non-unique geologic process. Wherever water goes from relatively shallow to relatively deep, th that will happen. Um, and that can happen on the scale of, you know, my hand, a couple of, you know, a handful of centimeters, or at the scale we saw um, on the screen. But great question, thank you. Right. <clears throat> Amy Hansen, Freelance. So I'm going to ask a really beginner's question here. How do you know it's water? I mean, is it just liquid that you are saying is water or do you have some H2O signature that I missed? No, another wonderful question and one that we ask ourselves, right, um, when we're looking at sedimentary rocks. Again, this is Libby Ives from JPL. Um, and what? so when we're thinking about Fluid transport that sorts material or has the ability to sort the grains into different grain sizes, very fine grain, very coarse grain, et cetera. Um, we think about wind and we think about water. The grains that are present in these sandstones are, are really, you know, they get up, they get pretty big and they're really too large to be transported by wind. And so that leaves us, you know, with a denser fluid, which is water. Um, and the I don't know if anybody has more insight into the salinity or, or anything like that. Well, yeah. I, I think it's important to say yeah. that these rocks have clearly interacted with water. Yeah. They are hydrated, <laughs> yeah. they are hydrous minerals. Uh, there's no need to call on some exotic fluid if that's what you were thinking. Yeah, and to, to add on to that, to what uh, Dr. Farley and Dr. Ive said, is that, uh, that we see this in the chemistry, right? That the most likely way to form the minerals we see in the maps we see, so these minerals right next to each other, like carbonate and silica, is if they precipitated, so they crashed out of liquid and formed these minerals from that aqueous phase. We have a question. Ooh. We have a question from Leo Enright on Irish TV. How many empty sample tubes remain? Would you leave another cache of tubes on the upper fan if you decide to return to the delta front? So we have uh, 13 sample tubes available for uh, rock and regolith, and we have two witness tubes left. And the question about whether we would leave another cache is completely dependent on what this uh, re-architecting um, effort that uh, is being uh, undertaken for the MSR program. John. Yeah. There we go. Right. Okay. Jonathan, uh, BBC again. Um, could you give us a, like a, a, a quick little storybook of Jezero Crater, right? So. Um, it's obviously impact at some point. Um, we have a crater and then water arrives and at some point the water goes. So in between, we've got water coming, we seem to have floods. Presumably there's a period when we're getting evaporation, when the, we're coming towards the end. Can you just talk us through that, that water history? Um, because presumably all of your samples record these various phases of that history, yes? 
Let me, let me start and then I'll turn it over to Libby. So what we know is that Jezreel Crater was formed in the vicinity of 3.9 billion years ago. And we also know based on the, the uh, typical dimensions of craters that the crater when it was formed was much deeper than it is now. Something filled it up uh, below where we are able to see it. The first rocks that we can see, the ones that are exposed on the surface are igneous rocks. They're, they're um, indicating either very thick lava flows uh, or possibly a lava lake uh, filling the crater. We don't know what lies below that. Could be more igneous rocks, could be something else altogether. And it's important to recognize that uh, there is potentially uh, hundreds of millions of years with a hole in the ground and gravity tends to fill in holes with something, we don't know what. Um, but after that, I turn the story over to, to Libby to describe. Yeah, so we know because the sediments overlie that igneous material that the sediments were deposited after that. Um, and, at, you know, after the lava cooled and the, the intrusion cooled later, you know, and all of this is relative, right, because we don't have precise ages, and that is something that Mars sample return um, could really help with, um, as many mentioned, the radiometric dating of some of these minerals. Um, but yeah, so, and then we can see, like I laid out in those three chapters, we see the fan start constructing itself into different iterations of the of standing water of this lake, so, you know, some probably relatively shallow and some quite deep, um, and those would be kind of the chapters one and two. And then chapter three that I described kind of, it seems separate, it seems to be a different iteration of the river because there's a bit of erosion between um, when those boulders, those mounds of boulders were deposited in the preceding sediments. Um, yeah, and at some point the water shut off and we get no more sediment flowing into the crater. Um, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I just yeah. add, add one okay. thing to this. It is absolutely amazing to be able to look at, for example, that pine stand mountain yeah. outcrop or even the flood boulders. Those are three and a half billion years old and they have just been sitting there for three and a half billion years. And that's important in the context of this question uh, because the reason that happened is the water disappeared. Climate change happened. So three and a half billion years ago or so, the water disappeared never to be seen again. Had that not been the case, this would all be gone. So one of the magic things about Mars is it has this ancient record that is not modified by eons of interaction with water like we have on Earth and is not modified by tectonics. So we've got this ancient record there to be, to be read as if it was deposited very recently. So, but I'm, I'm intrigued. You, you have this phase. Um, uh, so, I mean, you've got delta formation and all the rest of it, but then you get this. And I'm, I'm wondering what on earth is going on that all of a sudden you're having enormous bursts of water coming into the lake, right? I mean, to carry those, that's a colossal, that's a flood, you know, big flood. So, what, I mean, what is, what's happening, right? And then we've got carbonates. Well, I mean, that's you know, around the, around the ring. So what, what's, and that presumably is coming towards the end, yes? I mean, that's a, that's a, a much more um, slower environment. Yeah, you, you make a great point. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the water that must have transported those boulders, I mean, is impressive. That flow would have been very impressive. And there's, you know, we see evidence on the surface of Mars and the geomorphology of some of these canyons and even the canyon Norette Favalis that's feeding this fan um, can be, you know, I think it's like 200 meters deep. It's a, it's a pretty deep canyon. And so we see geomorphic evidence across the surface of Mars that very powerful flows must have existed. And there's some hypotheses for how those might have been initiated or formed. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, but um, I know people have suggested melting due to impact, like sudden outburst floods or maybe, or some other mechanisms, but you're right, it would have been a very impressive flow of water. And we are, and in terms of the marginal unit and how that fits into this whole story, that's something we're currently working on. And hopefully we'll have a story for you soon. How does a flood like that not destroy the delta, erode it? That's a good question too. So um, whether something erodes or deposit is, 
you can kind of picture it as a set of scales. You have the water flowing and then you have the sediment carrying with, that's being carried with it. And if the river is carrying a lot of sediment, its energy is being taken up by transporting that sediment and it doesn't have excess energy essentially to its size. And so, um, and we, I think with some recent observations from RIMFACS, we do see some erosional relationships below some of these um, boulder deposits, but generally it's that, that sort of balance. And there's also, there is quite a bit of, if you see the channel kind of coming in from, through the crater rim and then it cuts down through the fan and kind of moves towards the northeast. Um, we, so there looks like there was some erosion at some point. So, but it's always that balance between transport of sediment and the power of the river. Okay, we have a follow-up question for Ken from Leo, again from Irish TV. Uh, he was asking about the slide that had um, the nice panorama with the yellow track. Uh, on it, he asks, where are you right now on the yellow line, and when do you reach the highest point? How high do you climb in total? Sorry, going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, we haven't started that yellow line yet. Um, we, we are obviously where this image was taken from. <laughs> uh, and it is, uh, I believe it is about four kilometers to the far right-hand edge of this image where the yellow line ends. And our, our plan is to traverse that. That's the margin unit. Uh, we will traverse that and, uh, and then begin that journey up the, up the yellow line. Do I see any further hands in the room? Burning questions? Alex. Okay, Alex with Nature again for Ken. Sort of at this thousand soul milestone, are there things you didn't find in Jezero yet that you thought you would have found by now? The experience at Gale Crater has been that uh, there is a very large abundance of very fine-grained rock. And that's not what we found. We found some fine-grained rock. And this is important for the reason that, that you heard from, from Libby. Fine-grained rock is a target for certain kinds of um, astrobiology studies. We found a small amount of it, not a large amount of it. And I think that's telling us that, that this particular environment was, the, the rocks that are deposited here were not out in the middle of the lake. We can sort of infer that from the processes that you just heard. We were we're close to where the where the river flows into the in, and it's a higher energy environment, transporting larger particles. Um, and I would say the, the the flip side of that is that for many kinds of investigations that you can do either with the rover or with return samples, having larger grains is very important. Those grains can be analyzed. You know, if they're bigger than say. Uh, you know, a, a quarter of an inch, you know, with the, the biggest rock, rock fragments we have are that big. They, each one of them tells its own story. So uh, I think this is actually a, a, a really good contrast with Gale Crater in terms of what we found. We didn't find that much fine grain rock, but we found a lot of uh, diversity of coarser grains. Sorry, this is why I come. Um, if, just going back to the, the panel report, I think when they looked at the, um, uh, the initial drop, they were, critical is not the right word, but they said it was an incomplete collection to be worthy of bringing back. What, what, what you're saying now is that you, having got these extra samples, if they were to revisit that question, they would go, yeah, that is, that is the full set of, of what we sent you there to go get. I mean, obviously, would like more, but that is the basic requirement. You fulfill the basic requirement of, of Mars 2020. So what the Independent Review Board concludes is that, yes, the samples that are at Three Forks, those are all very interesting. It's a great, diverse set of samples. Uh, but they also then go on to say that as we continued to explore the upper fan and now in this marginal unit, 
um, there are some really compelling rocks in these areas that uh, in order to get the full picture of the story, the history of Jezero Crater, again, going back to the geology, the climate, and the astrobiology potential, that adding these additional samples from the, the top of the fan, and in particular, this marginal unit was one they focused on quite a bit, um, that we're here, we're, we can take these samples that we really want to make sure that we sample that part of the crater. Um, and that we want to be able to bring those samples back. And so that's uh, essentially what the, the IRB concluded. Yeah, the, the two samples that I talked about were all collected after the depot drop. So just a few couple really exciting, compelling examples supporting uh, what Dr. Glaze just said. One more online. Yes, we have one quick uh, sort of clarification question from Dan Clower, who writes for vision.org. He was looking for some clarification um, in a map view, one of our map view images, um, to help orient where this yellow line is in that perspective, if that is indeed included in any of those images. Yeah, let's go back to the, it may not even be on that first image. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, so if you um, see where the channel comes in to the, you know, breaches the rim just to the uh, west of the word Lefroy, oh, we have a, yep, yep, I'm rim. not sure they can see a pointer online. Oh, okay. um, but the, so the channel comes in there just to the west of Lefroy, and it, it, if you um, go right up to the rim where the inlet channel breaches and then head straight south uh, uh, on a diagonal up the rim, that's where that happens. I can point for the people in the room. Last call for questions from the room. Well, then with that, I think we'll thank our panelists so much for coming. Um, we hope you will join us at 2.30 for uh, the NASA's Tempo team talking about monitoring the air we breathe from space. And at 3.30, we'll have Mapping the World's Water with SWAT mission. At 4.30, also a media availability, um, how to build a broad and durable climate action plan with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And we hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 a.m. We'll have a briefing on ocean carbon removal, research applications, and ethics. Thank you all for coming.